Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, they do. Hey, Debbie, how are you? Hey, Columbia. Oh, 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 oh. Hang on. All right, let me turn that down a little bit to begin with. Hey, Rocky, how are you? Who, me? I haven't slept today. It is nighttime. We talked about how I slept this morning. You did something today. No. Did you do something today? Were you going? Oh, did you go to the doctor? Did you go to the doctor? Oh, I slept okay last night. I didn't hear the rocket launch. I'm doing well. Rocky, why don't you come over to this half size because you're going to miss all the conversation. You can't see what everyone is uh, talking about. Haps.tv. Yeah, helicopters in space. Yes. Hang on. I left my freaking coffee. I got to go grab my coffee. Tax man tomorrow. Oh, thrills, thrills. Oh, shoot. Oh. And of course, the washer just finished. Have to get the app? Well, what are you waiting for? Okay, I got to give JPL a lot of credit here. I think they've got the best music so far. <laughs> bon a Carmen, Carmen Lecture Series. Uh, 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 uh. You don't have much time left, Rocky. Come on now. What do you got? Two weeks? How long do we have? Three weeks, one day shy. 20 days. Why does this sound like it comes from a sitcom? Yeah, it sounds like it comes from a sitcom. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, oh, are we going? Are we, are we going live? Are we going live? 
Oh yeah. This is Jeff Proportion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. We are starting with Turn Up and Fly Right Maneuver, where the fish pack will jettison the entry valve passes in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Alpha take in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Oh, yes, the three company. Is 480 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield sub. Perseverance are going to slow to subsonic keys, and the heat shield has been separated. And it comes this back. allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. There it is. Velocity is look at it go. 45 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 kilometers, nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converged. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are commenting on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the climbing of the landing engine. Her current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Okay, we have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. We have climbing of the landing engine. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Whoa. We're getting signals from tomorrow. Tango Delta. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance oh. safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of Pat's life. I can watch it over and over and over. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the 2021 Virtual Von Karman Lecture Series. I am Nikki Weirich from JPL's of Communications and Education, and I will be your host for our topic tonight, Helicopters in Space. Many of you took the chance to join us on February 18th as we watched the Perseverance rover successfully land on Mars. With this landing, the helicopter Ingenuity has also arrived safely on the Red Planet. As a technology demonstration, the helicopter is set to test the first powered flight on another planet. Yes. It takes both ingenuity and perseverance to fly a helicopter on Mars. So let's take a moment to see what this duo will look like in action. There it is. Hello, John. 
welcome. It's just beginning. just incredible photos we have there. Uh, joining us this evening as co-host is Sarah Marcotte, Public Engagement Specialist for NASA's Mars Exploration Program. Sarah brings over two decades of experience in out-of-school environments, working to connect learners of all ages to current scientific research. Thank you, John. Hi, Sarah. Hello, Nikki. So uh, my role tonight is I will be taking your questions from the social media. It will Keep work. Those questions coming um, in the chat, wherever you're watching tonight. And I'm sure you're as excited as I am about the helicopter's first flight. So I want to make sure that you know where you can find out all the background information so that you'll be ready when the ingenuity lifts off the ground. Um, we have a website, of course, which is go.nasa.gov slash ingenuity. Now on those pages, you'll find all sorts of interesting things uh, so that you can learn about this historic mission. Uh, there's beautiful animations, there's images of the helicopter as it was being built in the clean room at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. There's um, cool quick facts, there's helicopter models, and there's activities for kids. So that's the, the best place to go to learn about the helicopter. And um, of course, when the helicopter sends back images that it takes during its flight, those images will be on that web page as well. So I'm excited to see your questions. I see they're already coming in, and uh, I'll be well, listening to our guests throughout the show. Thanks, Sarah. Great ways to get involved. As always, if we run into any technical difficulties tonight or small failures, we ask for your patience, and please do stick with us. We'll get them sorted out as soon as we can. Remember, this is your space program. We want you to get involved. As Sarah was saying, please put those questions in the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, YouTube, Facebook Live, LinkedIn, um, ask questions in the chat box. And our social media Anyone have any questions, ID, just put them in the chat and, and I can ask. Box, please make sure you refresh your page and it should be right there for you. Our first speaker tonight started his JPL career writing software for the Deep Space Network. He worked on flight software for the Curiosity rover and is now the Mars Helicopter Operations Lead at JPL. Please welcome Timothy Canham. Hi, Tim. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Tim. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to work on this project? And let's bring up image three. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate Perseverance and it's doing a great job in bringing the Ingenuity helicopter into a nice soft landing on the surface of Mars. So. I worked at JPL for a number of projects over the years. I started in the Deep Space Network. I worked on the Cassini project. And most recently, before the helicopter, I worked on the Curiosity rover flight software. As a matter of fact, much of my software that I wrote for Curiosity is now running on Perseverance as well. So most recently, our group had developed a set of software that we used on a number of projects internally. So I was asked to be the software lead for the helicopter. And we had a team of four or five programmers that put the software together and tested it. And since we operate the helicopter via the software, I was asked to be the operations lead to actually operate the helicopter once we got to Mars. It's an incredible story of how you ended up where you are today. But let's talk a little bit about the helicopter. How do you build a helicopter that's going to be able to fly on Mars? And if you could see image four, please. Well, when you design a helicopter for Mars, you have to keep in mind the environment you're going to fly in. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, so we need to design it to be very lightweight. The blades are very lightweight. They spin very quickly. And also, because we are so far from Earth, you can't have a joystick and just fly it like you would a drone at home. We had to write the software so that it could fly itself. We basically get it a set of instructions, and the helicopter takes off and flies to the places we tell it to. And we had an extensive test program here on Earth where we 
did many flights in a special chamber at JPL to prove that our software would work when we got to Mars. So we're very excited to be finally here and actually able to execute these flights on the surface of Mars. That's incredible, and I can't wait for the chance to see all of that. Um, we're actually going to bring the audience in right now and let them ask the next question for Tim. So, Sarah, I'm sure they're excited out there. What are they asking? So, Alethea on LinkedIn is asking, what are or what is one of the greatest challenges of piloting a helicopter in space? Well, as I mentioned before, yeah. The atmosphere is super thin, and so you can't design a helicopter like you do on Earth. And so we had to do very new kinds of algorithms in the software. We had to design hardware especially for flying on Mars. And so all of that was a challenge. We did things that have never been done before. It's sort of a right brother moment in that we get to go to a planet somewhere outside of Earth and try a helicopter there that's never been tried before. So we had to do special design work and special testing to make it happen. Sarah, let's do one more question from the audience for Tim. Sure thing. I like this one. Uh, this is from Margie on Facebook, and she's asking for her nine-year-old son, Jonah. So we've got a, a young space fan out here. So he says, how will ingenuity fly in a different gravity? Well, that's a great question. And we designed it to be lightweight because Mars has about one-third the gravity of Earth. And so we had to design that in when we did it. It's actually too heavy to fly on Earth. And so we had a special mechanism when we tested it here on Earth that would pull up on the top of the helicopter and simulate Mars gravity. So we could fly in a chamber that was pumped down to Mars pressure and have a special mechanism that allowed us to simulate the gravity of Mars and let it fly around in the chamber. So yes, we had to keep in mind the gravity of Mars when we flew. It sounds like a lot of testing went into this project. And thank you, Sarah, for that great set of questions. Now, as Tim, you alluded uh, to the of course, I can barely hear it. I'm actually shocked so you can. I'll go shut it off, me. but it's down Dr. low, Dr. low. Dr. Farah Alibe. Hi, Farah. Hi. So this next question is actually for both of you. What are the challenges of working on a mission like this, separate but united? Let's pull up image number five, and Tim, why don't you start off? Well, as a research project, that's how we started. And so when we were doing all of our development and testing, it was very much a very fast, rapid uh, high it's off now. environment where we make changes, we fix something, we try it again. And when you go to a project like the rover, uh, the Perseverance rover, everything is very structured and very um, regimented with lots of processes you have to do. And Farah has been a great harbor pilot. I call her our harbor pilot. She guided us through all the icebergs of big project land to, to get us on the rover and to help us figure out how to run all these things together. And it has been a challenge because we've all been remote with COVID and working together with Farah and the rest of the team has been a real learning experience for us. Well, nothing's on now, so. I'm sure it's been a great learning experience too. Farah, how about for you? Yeah, I mean, as Tim mentioned, one of the craziest things is Tim and I have actually never met in person. So I, I joined the team, you know, I've been on the Perseverance team for a long time, but I actually only started working on the helicopter right around launch when we really started thinking, well, this thing's on its way to Mars, we better figure out how to operate it. And so I was brought along and, and you know, we were deep in COVID and I've been interacting with the team remotely and it's crazy because I feel like we've become close friends even though, you know, we've never actually physically met. Um, but one of the challenges with helicopter is unlike other instruments, for example, on a rover, typically we're used to bringing the instruments with us wherever we go. Whereas with Ingenuity, you know, for the past few souls now on Mars, we've been looking for a place to drop it off, right? We, we are looking for a flat environment where we can leave the helicopter and then an area for us to watch it from and take those videos um, because, you know, we don't have a picture, it didn't happen. Um, and so, so it's a little bit unique in that sense that, you know, we, it's a different mission. We're bringing it along with us. It has its own needs um, and we have to help it figure out, you know, we have to help it achieve its goals. And, and that's really what Perseverance is there for. And for this particular tech demo is we are there to set the stage for the first flight on Mars um, and help our, our friend uh, achieve its mission goals. 
I mean, what a great example of teamwork, especially during the times of COVID. Uh, Tim, we're going to come back to you in a little bit for some more questions, but right now we're going to keep chatting with Farah, who has been a systems engineer at JPL for the past seven years, working on several missions, including the InSight, Mars Lander, and Marco CubeSat. Today, one of her roles on the Perseverance mission is to lead the operations interface with the Mars helicopter technology demonstration. So Farah, you've had a pretty exciting month. We are living on Mars time right now. Can you explain what is Mars time and why are you on it? <laughs> yeah, so it's currently about 8.45 a.m. for Perseverance right now, uh, which, uh, <clears throat> well, so it's not 8.45 a.m. for me, but what I do right now and what the rest of the Perseverance team is doing is that we are working during the Martian night. And that's what we call Mars time. So our rover is too far away from Earth. And so we can't just come in it. You know, it's not like we sit behind our desks with joysticks driving the rover. I wish it was that way. Mars is way too far. So when we send signals to Mars, you know, they're radio signals. They go at the speed of light. But it's so far away that it takes about 13 minutes right now for a signal to get from Earth to Mars. She and needs a toner. To Her back. hair's orange. It would be a really long Oops. and boring day if we were sending a command and waiting each time for an answer. So what we do instead is that each night the rover sends us information. It sends us images. It sends us data. It tells us what it did that day. We as a team analyze it, so we go into work at about 6 p.m. perseverance time every night. Hey, Danny. And then we analyze the data, we prepare a plan for the next day as a team, and then we send it back up to the rover. Um, and we send it up before it wakes up in the morning at about 8 a.m. So we work the Martian night shift, right? Which, okay, that seems fine. You just shift your schedule. But it's not that easy because a Martian day, which is what we call the assault, is actually about 24 hours and 40 minutes. So it's just a little longer than Earth. So even though I start my day at the same time on Mars every day, at about 6 p.m. every day, my start time on Earth shifts by 40 minutes every day. So this morning, for example, my wake-up time was about you know 4.30 a.m. Tomorrow will be more like 5.10 and so on. So we're coming up this week and next week. That's why I was able to join you today. In, in days where the Martian night is lining up with the Earth day. But I just came out of doing the night shift of, of having to wake up in the middle of the night. So it's just a shifting schedule. And we're doing that for the first 90 days of the mission, which is also critical times. We need to be working every single day on the rover to get everything checked out, to get the Ingenuity mission done, all of those key activities that everyone's so excited about. I mean, that's definitely a lot of dedication that y'all's team are putting into this. Um, as we saw before, the rover has safely made it to Mars, and that video was just incredible watching it land. I never get tired of it. Can you explain your role in relation to the helicopter mission? And let's pull up image six. Yeah, so as Tim mentioned, my job basically is to it's just to help accommodate the helicopter uh, tech demo. So, and there's really two parts to this. Right now, you can see in the picture, actually, the helicopter is tucked in under the belly of the rover. It's actually horizontal below, below the rover. It's connected, right? It gets, it gets heat, it gets, we can communicate with it. And we have to deploy it on the surface of Mars. So in the upcoming weeks here, once we find a site that's suitable, we are going to go through a deployment process where we go from the helicopter being horizontal to going all the way vertical. And then there's the last, the last day of our deployment is when we separate the helicopter from the rover. And what's special about that day is that from the moment that we separate from the helicopter from the rover, we have to drive off of it and expose the solar panels from the helicopter within 24 hours of that drop. Because if we don't drive off on time, if we have any problem, then there's a chance that the helicopter might not survive uh, the Martian night, which is so cold, because it needs that energy from the solar panel. So my job is to be, then to coordinate all of those activities, coordinate the rover side activities, um, to get that deployment done, to drive off, to do all of the imaging during the flights, um, and to coordinate, for example, communicating with the helicopter. Um, the helicopter can't talk directly back to Earth. It has to send its signals through the rover and then to Earth. Um, so there's a, basically, I call it sort of a dance. There's a very careful dance that has to happen between the two projects. And I'm, I'm sort of the choreographer for those dances uh, to make sure that everything happens, everyone is right there when they need to be uh, in order to, to have a successful mission. 
that seems really complicated. And both you and Tim have talked about how this isn't like using a joystick to command these spacecraft. So how do you prepare for something like that? And let's pull up video seven while you talk us through this. So we test, 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 and test some more. I can't tell you how much time I've spent hey, in the Mars yard at GPL in the past few months. So, so the Mars yard is basically a big sandbox. It looks like Mars. You're seeing it in the video there. And we have a replica of both Ingenuity and Perseverance. Perseverance rip, per, the, the replica for Perseverance is called Optimism. And we use those Earth, you know, those Earth robots to test before we get to Mars. And we test everything, all of the activities, all of the sequences, the timing to make sure that once we do it on Mars, it's not the first time, it, you know, it should be boring by the time we do it on Mars because we've done it so many times. So the video that you're seeing here, for example, is what we hope the deployment day will look like on Mars. So we tested our deployment um, and we tested driving off of it. And the other thing that we do is that we also test our people. Um, so back in, in, in late January, we had a dress rehearsal for the day that we're going to drop the helicopter. So we had all of our team, you know, in the control room and I was sending them data and, and you know, spoofing anomalies and things like that. And people had to react to them and, and do that go, no goes and decide, okay, are we gonna drive off? Is the helicopter separated? What's the health of the helicopter? So, um, so that's really helped us build confidence in our ability to do this. And, you know, I think we're as ready as we can be, and we're really excited to get to do it uh, for real on Mars. It's a little bit like, you know, when you rehearse for a show for a long time, and then you're ready for prime time. I think that's where we're at right now. I love what you said about this being a boring moment because you've tested it so many times that you want to make sure that it's going to work. And if it goes according to plan, I, I guarantee it will not be a boring moment for any of us. <laughs> that's a great way to think about it. Um, we're actually going to get the audience involved again to ask our next question. So, Sarah, what are they asking out there for Farah? Well, I'm struggling because there are so many great questions coming in, so I'm having a hard time deciding. Um, but there were there are a couple themes emerging here, and so I thought these were really interesting. So, um, for Farah, so Kurt on LinkedIn is asking, and it's also kind of related to what Alicia on YouTube is asking. That's me. The, um, dust storms. So how will ingenuity react to adverse environmental conditions such as dust storms? Um, you know, will they work and will the helicopter work in stormy weather? What do you think? So we're not even going to try and fly in, in stormy weather. One of the advantage of having perseverance is that we actually have a weather station on board the rover. Um, so we have wind sensors, we have temperature, and we've actually been very closely watching the temperature and and the winds since we landed we actually had a meeting today where we looked at the you know at the at the results that we have so far to try and see okay you know not just is there anything going on on mars right now but even what time of day do we think it's better to fly um the winds on mars as it turns out are really predictable um so on from a day-to-day -day basis this has been a lot more windy than others um so we're trying to evaluate right now okay what the, what are the patterns starting to look like and when do we think that we want to fly to avoid sort of the gustier times of day so um so yeah we we came prepared we're all with our own weather station in order to to figure that out and uh and give us the best chance of success it's always good to be very prepared um i think we've got time for another question before we move on so sarah is there another one out there for far that we could ask sure sure so Alethea on LinkedIn is wondering, how do you balance uh, a lightweight helicopter with a helicopter that can do, endure an impact? I guess maybe when it comes back after a flight. So how do you balance those two things? It's gotta be light, but it's gotta be strong. Yeah, I mean, that's all part of the challenges of designing things for Mars, right? Is they have to be robust for the environment and they also have to be, um, and they also have to meet constraints like light, like we light in this case. So, um, so I'm sure that Tim could actually provide a lot more detail into exactly how, um, how the helicopter was designed. Uh, but I can tell you that with anything in engineering, there's a lot of cycles of iteration, right? We probably we start with a design and then we test it out, we try it again until it meets those requirements. That's true for the helicopter. That's true for the rover wheels, for example, right? We, 
we redesigned the wheels on this mission and uh, we tested you know, dozens of different types of wheels in order to get there. And I'm sure it was the same story for the helicopter, but maybe Tim can, can add a little bit of information here. No, it's a female. The helicopter was designed we think. to be both strong and light. So it's made of carbon fiber in many cases, which is really light but really strong. The blades are can spin really fast and lift the weight of the helicopter, but if you pick one up, it would be about the weight of a sheet of paper. So the whole helicopter weighs about four pounds, but yet it's able to you know, lift itself up and fly around. And we did many tests of the legs. You know, the legs are springy so that if we bounce a little bit on landing, they don't break, and they're very stable. They have a wide stance, so that if we bounce a little one side, we can recover. And it's a very tough system. So we spent a lot of time, we had some advanced partners that helped us out, that designed it so they could be strong and light at the same time. So we're very confident that whatever Mars can throw at us, we'll be able to handle it. Well, in your confidence, we trust. So uh, we are gonna take a couple more questions from the audience in just a moment for both of you. But I have one final question for you. Is this part of the dream of working at JPL? You get to be a part of a unique, first of its kind mission. Is that why you've come to work at a place like this? And Tim, why don't you take that one first? We're gonna pull up image eight. Well, sure, it's definitely a dream. I grew up in small town America, and I grew up reading all the National Geographic issues about the Voyager probe and all the different other planets that have visited. I love to consume all kinds of astronomy books and I was generally a computer geek, so all this stuff came together really well. And I was able to get a job out of college at JPL and do really exciting things, which is really culminating in this chance to do a first of a kind thing on Mars, which is to fly a helicopter, which has never been done before. So sure, we're very nervous, but we're confident in our helicopter and we're excited to go. And we're really looking forward to it. And how about for you, Farah? Is this part of the dream of working at JPL for you as well? Absolutely. So for me, you know, my story is that my first summer at JPL was the summer of 2012, and I was an intern, an intern during graduate school. And the summer of 2012, for those of you who are space fans, is the summer that Curiosity landed on Mars. And I still remember that moment in the auditorium. It was like late on a Sunday evening, and I was super nervous with my friends watching, watching the landing. But what was so incredible as an intern is to be on lab and to see you see these incredible people achieving the impossible, right? Like, who sends a massive rover to Mars and lowers it from a sky crane on the surface of Mars? And who's crazy enough to do that? Apparently people at JPL, and I thought, I want to be one of those crazy people. Um, and that is really, you know, when that, it started, I I knocked on every manager's job with my door with my resume. I was like, I want to work here. This is what I want to do. I want to be part of a team like this. I want to do these things. Um, so, uh, so I was lucky enough to get a job back in 2014, and, and this is yeah, my second Mars mission, but, um, but with this one, it's really coming full circle, right? Perseverance is sort of the, the big sister or, for curiosity, and it's, it, it is that next big mission, and it's so cool to be able to say that I am not part of the team that's making history, right? Like, I'm part of that team that's doing crazy things on Mars. Um, and it's it's super humbling too to to have, like come full circle that way and be part of that team and and what's special with Ingenuity is you know with the other missions at JPL we've had other rovers before so often when we have problems you know there's always someone to call we can call the person that did it on Curiosity and ask like you know we have a similar problem here can you help me it's not the case with Ingenuity no one's done this before there's no textbook there's no one to call we just got to figure it out and that. That is sort of like the best piece of engineering right there, right? Like we, we have to figure it out. We figure it out as a team. We come up with creative solutions and, and you know, we're, we're the ones writing the textbooks, right? And, and eventually I can't wait one day when, you know, hopefully that this all goes well and, and you know, when we'll be the ones getting the phone calls. We'll be the ones that people are going to reach out to when they want to fly the next helicopter on Mars. Really incredible, groundbreaking work that you both are doing. And I am sure that social media is lighting up with questions. For those of you that are still watching uh, with us, please make sure you put those in the chat and our social media team will bring them to us as quickly as possible. We'll answer as many as we can. Sarah, how's it looking out there? Oh, there's plenty, there's plenty. Can I ask one right now? 
Okay. I don't know if his name is Brian or Brain. I kind of hope it's Brain, but it's uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, this is a question for you, Tim. Um, how did you simulate the low gravity and low atmospheric pressure during testing on Earth? Well, JPL, along with being a place that has cool spacecraft, it also has cool ways to test things. So there's a chamber at JPL. It's 25 feet across and 70 feet high. And they've used it for years for spacecraft to pump down and pump out the air to get it to either a pure vacuum, or in our case, we, we pumped it down to 1% of Earth's density, so that's where the helicopter will fly. So that's how we're able to get the equivalent atmosphere. And we had some very clever engineers that came up with the design. We called it our gravity offload mechanism. It was a it was a special computerized system that had a tether or a big cable that would come down and attach to the top of the helicopter and it literally pull it up in a way that would simulate Mars gravity. So that way we had this chamber that could simu both simulate Mars gravity and also the air pressure of Mars. And so that's where we did almost three years of testing to get the helicopter ready for Mars. That's uh, quite a bit of dedication. I mean, you've already showcased that tonight, how dedicated you've been, but three years of testing, that's quite dedicated. Sarah, we've got time for a few more questions. Great, excellent, okay. Um, so this one is for you, Cara. Uh, Pedro on LinkedIn. So a lot of questions from LinkedIn tonight, this is great. Um, how will Perseverance track ingenuity in the sky? Is there a beacon or object recognition? Uh, that's a great question, Pedro. So, um, so actually, what we do is that we can localize the helicopter, and we're going to keep track of where it is on the ground. And then, based on uh, based on what we think the flights are going to be like, we're going to set off field of view while enough our cameras to be able to catch the flights. So. So when we drop off the helicopter, we'll know exactly where it is, and we'll have, you know, we keep really good maps of Mars when we drive. So we'll have a map of where we are and where it is, and then as we drive away from it, uh, we'll be augmenting those maps and relocalizing using images every time. So think of it as, like, I set a pin on a map, and I try and point back to it, and based on my images, I can sort of adjust a little bit what the, the error might be, you know, in my uh, my position or what I think my position might be with the helicopter. So so even at 100 meters away, we'll know where the helicopter is and we'll be able to image it before its flight so we know exactly where it is. And then the morning of that first flight, for example, we'll point all our cameras at it and multiple cameras and we'll wait eagerly and we are even going to take a video, hopefully, of the flight. And then we should see that that helicopter um, in our field of view. And then when we're done and it lands, we'll be able to relocalize again and figure out um, where it, exactly where it landed. Okay, and I'm going to have for Tim here. Oh, sorry about that. I just didn't mean to jump out there, but I'm going well, in. I'm there going in. <laughs> Great. Kirk on Facebook. Um, I thought this was just for you, Tim. Uh, does the helicopter have any smarts to adjust if its flight model is not exactly what it's discovering on Mars? Basically, is the, can the helicopter make adjustments or learn learn along the way? Well, certainly the software is, uh, we did a lot of testing on flight algorithms. <coughs> we have a very talented guidance control team, and they built the software to follow a set of waypoints. So before the flight, we get together as a team and we plan where we want the flight to go. And then the software on board will take those waypoints and fly that trajectory. And the software has the built-in smarts to adjust to environmental conditions it might encounter, like gusts of wind or, you know, just deviations in the flight path. It's, it's very well designed to bring it back into alignment with the path that we had planned for it. So that was part of the new development that we did for this project is they designed all new brand new algorithms that can handle the Martian environment plus this mission that we gave it to fly along these trajectories and do what it needs to do because it's not only flying based on an inertial sensor, it has a camera system that points downward. We're taking pictures 30 times a second, looking at features inside the camera, the image of the camera, and then track those features from frame to frame. And that's how the helicopter is able to know which direction it's going and how fast along with the, the inertial sensor and even an altimeter. So it's a pretty sophisticated little robot that's finding its way across the landscape.
we have time for some more questions, Sarah. So feel okay. free to ask a couple <laughs> more. <laughs> okay, uh, this is also for Kim, because this is a little bit about uh, the helicopter team. And so I know that you've been on the helicopter team for a long time. Um, so Rhonda on Facebook is wondering, first of all, how big the helicopter team is. And then um, sort of a related question from Whitetailed Jedi on YouTube is who gets to pilot the helicopter every day? <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. So we had a team, I would say at our peak, we were probably 30 or 40 different people, all bringing different kinds of talents to the table. I'm here because I'm representing operations, but there was many other talented people on the project who did mechanical design, thermal design, and power design. And when you mentioned the pilot, our chief pilot, Hobart Griff, is a very talented uh, guidance engineer. He even flies planes for fun. So he's a naturally gifted guy for doing this, and he's the one with his team that are going to be planning each one of the flights. And so that's how it works. It's, it's the guidance team gives me the path they want to follow. We enter it into a series of commands. It's that file of commands we give to Far and her team, and we're beaming up to the rover. And then the rover sends it across to the helicopter and executes it. And then we get to wait until we see the data as we chew our fingernails to the bone. Okay, here's another question. Why don't you try and take this far? Um, Gabriel on LinkedIn is asking, so how does communication between the Mars instruments get affected by um, the lack of the magnetic field that is on Mars? And um, does the solar radiation um, affect the communication between the helicopter and the rover? So we... Obviously, the, you know, the environment on Mars is, is different from the one on Earth, but one of the things that we did on Earth before we went to Mars is that we actually tested that communication. We do something called electromagnetic interference testing. And so we put the rover in a special chamber that's quiet like Mars, or as quiet as we can get it. And, um, and one of the things that we had to do, actually, is we had to figure out if there were any instruments on the rover, like when we're changing or switching things on the rover, whether any of that magnetic noise that's created when you use those instruments might affect the link between the helicopter and the rover. And so, you know, we're talking from the helicopter to the rover using a radio that has a certain signal, and we want to make sure that there's not noise in that signal created by other instruments on board. And we actually found that there's a few instruments that, uh, for example, if we're moving on motors, that that creates just enough noise that we can lose communication with the rover, we can lose packets. Um, so that's why we do that kind of testing before we go so that we kind of understand the behavior. And then when we get to Mars, um, we're going to sort of restrict the usage of certain things Like we won't be moving our arm all over while we're talking to the helicopter so that we know that we can get a clean signal that way. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely a test that every single um, spacecraft goes through. It's one of the key tests that we do before launch uh, to figure out what's compatible with what and make sure that we can... Uh, we can successfully communicate uh, with our helicopter in this case. Okay, do we have time for another one? Yep, we yeah, have time for another one. <laughs> you got it. Ron on LinkedIn is asking, will the helicopter attempt to land atop higher elevation features or typically always return nearby the rover? I guess that's for you, Barb. So um, right now the plan is to is to land at the same place. So what we've done or what we're doing on Mars right now is we're trying to identify a flight to Somme. So it's an area that's about 30 meters across and about 100 meter long, and that is going to be our stage to play on. That's that's where the helicopter is allowed to fly. And within that, there's a little there's an area that we you know that we're going to identify or try and find that will have you know we're looking for a flat area with hardly any rocks. Uh, where the helicopter can land. That's kind of it's like landing pad, right? Like, so if you have a helicopter on Earth and you, you, it can only really land in that flat area with a big H on it, that's that's going to be our, our helicopter on Mars. No big H, but, you know, we'll have our area where we're going to um, be able to drop our helicopter and fly to and from there. So so the goal is to, is to always return to that home base and then from there do increasingly more complicated flights. So at the beginning, we'll just go up and down and then we'll go across uh, and then we'll see. Maybe 
uh, maybe the team, the helicopter team, will get sporty and and uh, and try to break free of the current plan. But for now, we're planning on, on landing at the same time. Huh. We all like that. Just a couple more questions. Probably about two more. Oh, okay, okay. Hey, Myrna. All right. Angelica from LinkedIn. She's getting it. Um, this is for you, Tim. So what is the actual flight goal of the vehicle? Um, is it flight time? Is it distance? And is there a particular forward velocity that um, you're looking for with the helicopter? Well, since this is a kind of a new a new mission, we've never done this before. The primary objective of this mission is to characterize what it's like to fly on Mars. So we're going to be doing, as far as said, a series of these increasingly aggressive flights, and we, we take lots of data during those flights, and we analyze that data on the ground to see how it performed, and then that's the kind of data that will feed forward in the future possible helicopters that can do more and have greater capability. And so that's really the objective is to is to test how well it flies. And so we'll, we'll be doing these increasingly harder flights to stress the system a little more each time and see you know how the data comes back when we do those flights and how it responds to those various things in the environment like wind and altitude. And we're going to fly at about five meters high. We're a little bit limited by our altimeter, the, how far down it can see and the camera system. So it'll be about five meters high, and we'll be flying two or three meters per second horizontally when we do our horizontal flights. So it's not going to exactly buzz the tower, so to speak, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be faster than a rover. That's one of the promises of a vehicle like this, is that the rover potentially could see a feature in the distance that it thinks is very cool, but it could take days or even a week to get there. And something like a helicopter could fly over there in just a few tens of seconds and analyze and inspect it. So that's part of what this mission is about, is to do this groundbreaking work to see how well it performs on Mars so that future generations of helicopters can do even more cool things. I like that, even more cool things in the future. And speaking of things in the future, we have one final question, Sarah, for our speaker tonight. Okay, let's take it from Facebook. From Matt on Facebook asks, will imagery from the helicopter be used to help Percy's Navigate the Martian ter terrain and it Percy, really? And I can take that one. So, so that, that's probably a good one for you, Barb. So, um, in the nominal plan, no. Um, so, what we're learning again, as Tim, as Tim just mentioned, right? Um, ingenuity is paving the way for future helicopters, for future missions. We want to demonstrate that. You know that helicopters can fly on Mars, and and by the way, rovers started as technology demonstrations too. We had that's where we started. You know, a small team came up with a small rover on Mars, and 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 that showed that we could drive on Mars. And now look what we're doing, right? So so we're really hoping that one day ingenuity will be that stepping stone also for for bigger um, helicopters. But but in this in this case, you know the the area that. Um, that ingenuity is flying over is one that we've already imaged. We actually wanted to assess that area to make sure that it was safe. Um, so that, you know, if, if ingenuity needs to do an emergency landing, for example, we know that it's a safe area, that it doesn't have big boulders and things like that. So, so again, at least, you know, for the current playbook and who knows what, you know, what the, um, what the team is going to decide to do once, you know, if we are successful with those first few flights, but, well, the first few flights, at least, it's, it's going to be an area that we've already imaged. Um, but it definitely is going to be really interesting, right, to look at um, the path that it takes and the images that it takes and compare that to what we know about the surface. And, again, that's going to help us learn about what it what it's like to fly on Mars and, and what it takes. So um, so it's definitely you know going to be something that we're looking forward to. Great ability to develop new technology. Uh, thanks for those wonderful questions to all of you out there. And thank you, Sarah, for presenting those to our speakers. But unfortunately, that is all the time we have today for questions. Please join us next month for our lecture and Earth Day special, Science on Ice, what ice says about past, present, and future climate. I want to thank our speakers, Tim Tannum and Dr. Clara Oliver. Thank you so much for joining us and discussing this very exciting topic. 
Also, big thank you to our wonderful questions co-host, Sarah Marcotte, and everyone working behind the scenes to make this possible tonight. And to all of you watching, thank you for taking the time to join us every month, and thank you for your wonderful questions. If you've missed one or would like to revisit any of our Von Karman talks from the past five years, they are available on JPL's YouTube page. Thank you again, everyone. Be well, have a wonderful evening, and we will see you in April. I was a little disappointed. I really was. They really didn't get into the tech like I thought they would. Ah, same thing. Look what I just said, right? So, what do you want to know? Because I have the actual mission, uh, the key objectives, which they didn't even go over the, they went briefly over the key objectives, right? But they didn't hit, like, I don't know. I was just, it lacks the information that I've read. Um. My press book is, this is my press book, y'all. Look, look, this is my press book. This is, this is my press kit that I received, okay? All right? Look at how thick and how many pages it is. It, this is no joke. This is from JPL, okay? NASA, but mostly JPL, okay? Mostly. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, I, I'm, oh. so let me read you what I have and, and, okay, key objectives, demonstration of powered flight in thin atmosphere of Mars. The red planet has lower gravity, about one third of Earth, but its atmosphere is only 1% as thick making it much harder to generate lift, right? The first test flight is expected to take place in spring 2021 after about six souls of activities to check out the helicopter. So that's probably like 12 days, about, about 12 days. Because one soul... Is two Earth days, right? So, we should be getting close to flight. The helicopter could fly as high as 15 feet, 5 meters in altitude, and as far as 160 feet, 50 meters downrange. The longest that engineers will try to fly the helicopter on each flight will be 90 seconds. And people, I, I don't know, 90 seconds is not long at all. Um, to demonstrate miniaturized flying technologies on another planet. To fly in thin atmosphere, ingenuity was limited to a total mass of about 4 pounds, 1.8 kilograms. The rotor system, solar panels, landing gear, fuselage, and other components must be very lightweight. Well, 24 hours and 40 minutes, right? And it adjusts every day ahead 40 minutes. So two years soul is one earth. No, am I doing it backwards, right? Am I doing it backwards? Two Earth years is one, no, two Mars years is one Earth year. Am I good? Am I saying that right? Because that's what we were told. And it adjusts by 40 minutes ahead. That's why her day changes by 40 minutes every single day ahead.
Right. But when you get to the end of one year, it's already two Mars years. That's the way they explained it, Columbia. I'm saying it wrong. So two Earth years is one Mars? No, that's absolutely... In, in, yeah, maybe it is. Okay, so yeah, I, I am saying it backwards, right? So two Earth years is one Mars year. Not 48 hours. Two Earth years is one... Right, one Mars Mars year. Is that right? Couldn't think of the word and I just came up with it. Autonomous. That's what it's going to be flying. It's autonomously. Jesse used to do the robots. With school. And he used to have to do. They would have to program the robot. To do moves. I'll go back and read it. Um, so that's what they're going to be doing. It's a, a, the autonomous. Yeah, so it's autonomous. So Jesse used to have to, uh, he can explain this so much better. Like they used to prog program the robot to go this way, this way, pick something up, right? Then go this way, this way, and then like drop the ball into the hoop, right? He used to, this is what they used to do. And they would get extra points if they completed it, right? Um, and if you didn't have the robot sitting in the right spot where you had it, <laughs> oh, my Lord. If they didn't have it sitting in the right spot when they hit the go button, <laughs> it could be so far off, so far off. And you weren't allowed to have your robot on the floor. Like, you had to know where your mark was when you program when you were programming it at your table and you brought it over like you practice this you know they knew what they were going to have to do but they would practice it and if it was wrong they would have to go in and reprogram it and that's what jesse used to do was the programming of the robot and stuff so uh but that used to be cool when he used to do that stuff he that was cool when he did that shit so um So communication wirelessly with perseverance by remaining within 0.6 of a mile, one kilometer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. So that's why. Yeah. So they, they always say like, it'll be one year our time versus two years more time. That's how they always said it to us in the lectures whenever we went to this stuff. Um, and we talked with JPL and stuff like that. Um, so that's what's always been in my head. Um, and it does have two cameras, one color and one black and white, by the way. And that, <clears throat> I did ask that question as well. 
So, and I really didn't like that they were staying on LinkedIn. Nobody uses LinkedIn. Okay. Nobody. And that dear white, that, that Jedi white, dear white Jedi or whatever that was. You should have seen the shit that she was saying in chat on YouTube. Like, um, do you have insurance on it? You know, you can get a discount with Geico. That's what she was doing in chat. Like the immaturity and cap, you know, typing in all caps and stuff like that. Like I was paying attention. So, um, like the Rover, the helicopter is too far from earth to be operated with joysticks. So engineers will have to learn how to operate an area vehicle very remotely. The helicopter is designed to fly, land, communicate, manage the energy, and keep warm autonomously. Innovative mathematical algorithms will optimize flight, efficiency, and survival. I love this stuff. This one is good. And then so they were talking about no, I didn't. Mm -mm. No. Uh, um so the um, Mars Environmental Dynamic Analy Analyzer, Analyzer, Meta. Um, Meta is a set of centers distributed across Perseverance, mast and body that measures wind, speed, and direction, air pressure, relative humidity, ambient temperature, and solar radiation. Solar ra radiation affects the surface environment, and it is important to understand more fully before sending humans to Mars, a skyward facing camera, Skycam, measures how tiny airborne particles or aerosols such as dust and ice can affect sunlight reaching the surface. Oh, yeah, a lot of people were acting, asking that. Yeah, of course it does. And they, um, It should juice. I, I mean, it's the pink one juice and it says haps. There should be only one juicy. There should be only one. And it said it's pink and it says haps. I don't have, you know, I'm Apple. So I, I don't know what's on the Play Store. And I don't know why there would be one, more than one. You can go to probably go to haps.tv on a web browser and it should have links to the Play Store in there to make sure you get the right one. Um, Moxie's going to be the cool one. Uh, yes, pink. Yeah. Oh, it is Debbie. Yeah, it's the pink one. I don't know if there's more than one. <clears throat> it's probably not T Mobile Magenta. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no joke, everyone. Like, uh, all the historical uh, missions are here that have gone to Mars. I mean, it has everything, right? There's web video links for us. Um, and, and, and just mind you, like, by the way, just look at this. This is one page. Oops. 
this is one page of historical missions to Mars or anything to do with Mars, shall we say, right? I, I would say it would be Haps News. It's not a dating site. Even though I know you wish it was. And then there's another page here. And they started in 1960. You, um, Marsnik, um, Russia. USSR, actually, shall I say, because that's what it was at the time. It did not reach, uh, flyby, did not reach Earth's orbit. Uh, Marsnik, USSR, uh, flyby, did not reach Earth's orbit. Sputnik. Phoenix Mars Lander. Is that the one that crashed? Landed May 25th, 2008. Completed prime mission and began external mission. Last communicated November 2nd. Oh, no. Which one crashed? Oh, Mars Polar Lander, Deep Space 2. Yeah, I'm looking now. Pathfinder. It was the one that... Uh... There was one, remember when they used to bounce it in a, like a ball? Insight, wasn't it? It was before, was it be Yeah, MRO is still up there currently. Just um, that's the one that's used for the communication with Perseverance now. Well, and Curiosity. The European Space Agency and Russia Space Agency's Roscosmo plan to launch the ExoMars 2022 mission in 2022 to deliver a European rover, Roslyn Franklin, and a Russian surface platform. Kazachak. NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA, are solidifying concept for a Mars sample return campaign. And after NASA's Perseverance rover collects rock and sediment samples, storing them in sealed tubes to be left on the planet's surface for future retrieval and Earth's um, return to Earth. Spirit and opportunity were basketball. Yeah, but there was one that they lost. Bef I don't know if it was between Spirit and Opportunity, but those were sisters, right? Spirit and Opportunity were sisters. They landed very close to each other. Um, but there was one that was lost. According to the current concept, NASA will deliver a lander with a NASA rocket, the Mars Ascent Vehicle, 
an ESA sample fetch rover. The fetch rover will gather and catch samples and carry them to the lander for transfer to the ascent vehicle. Samples could also be delivered by Perseverance. ESA will put a spacecraft in orbit at Mars. The ascent vehicle will then launch itself, launch a special container holding the samples into Mars orbit. The orbiter will rendezvous with the capture orbiting samples in order to return them to Earth. NASA will provide the payload module for the orbiter performing the capture and containment of the orbiting samples at Mars and landing the samples on Earth. Did the no um Mars Polar Lander D Space Two Lander and two penetrators. Oh, there it is. Yes, it is. There it is. Mars Climate Orbiter U.S. December eleventh, nineteen ninety eight. Orbiter lost. That's an orbiter though. This is a lander. Mars Polar Lander Deep Space Two. U.S. January 3rd, 1999, lander and two per penetrators lost on arrival, December 3rd, 1999. There it is. Yep. Now was. See, Pathfinder was there, right? Pathfinder was there already. Mars Odyssey still working, right? Mars Express Beagle 2. Beagle 2 was lost. Right. Yes. 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 Insight was 2018. Landed November 26th. 2018, currently conducting prime missions at Asylum Planetia. And then Phoenix, Mars, Opportunity. Aw. Um, Opie. Uh, landed um, July, January 25th, 2004 for three months. Prime mission is the uh, Meridinium Plan Planium region. Completed several extended missions. Last communicated June 10th, 2018. Mission declared completed on February 13th, 2019. Opie phone home. The dust got too much on its solar panels. Even though it was hiding from the dust storm, but that was one of the worst dust storms that they had seen, right? <clears throat> so, boy, they did everything to try to communicate with it. So Curiosity landed August 6, 2012, right? Completed Prime Mission is currently conducting extended science missions. It's getting dark, yes. Oh, stop. Opie, oh.
and Maven um, is still there, which it's still communicating, which is uh, atmosphere and volatile evolution mission. And the Mars Orbiter mission, mom. The Exo Mars 2016 Trace Gas Orbiter and Shirafella module, which the module didn't make it, right? Uh, Mars Cube 1. Two Cube satellites data relays for InSight lander flew by Mars and completed relay November 26, concluded operations February 2nd, 2020. Mar Mars Global Remote Sensoring Orbiting and Small Rover, China. Oh, isn't that the one that didn't make it? Is that the one that didn't make it? Summer of 2020. Mars Global Global Remote Sensing Orbiter and Small Rover. That's the one that did not make it. pretty sure yeah I don't remember if it overshot or if it just didn't make the landing I don't remember I don't remember July, August, September, October, November. So, Ingenuity is what is known as technology demonstration, a project that seeks to test new capability for the first time with limited scope. Previous groundbreaking technology demonstrates includes the Mars Pathfinder rover, Sojourner, and the Mars Cube 1 Marcio CubeSat that flew by Mars. It says, uh, these are the shots that it's got to do. What? Surviving the launch, which it did, right? It survived the cruise. It safely deployed and landed, right? Autonomously keep warm through in intensively cold Martian nights, which it's doing. Autonomously charging itself with its solar panels. So once they release Ingenuity, then they'll have to find that out. And then if Ju Ingenuity succeeds in its first flight, the helicopter team will attempt up to four other test flights within a 30-day Martian day, 31 Earth Day window. So, so, it 
And then it says, if it succeeds, that ingenuity is intended to demonstrate technologies needed for, for flying in Martian atmosphere. It's successful. These technologies could enable other advanced robotic flying vehicles that might be included in future robotic and human missions to Mars. Among the possibility uses of future helicopters on Mars, offering a unique viewpoint not provided by current orbiters high overhead or by rovers and landers on the ground. High definition images and reconnaissance for robots or humans and access to terrain that is difficult for the rover to reach. A future helicopter could even help carry light but vital payloads from one site to another. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, totally amazing. So, but let me look up something. So, let me look at something real quick. Oh, yeah, they do. They do, right? And their carbine, too? Yeah. It's got to spend so many more times revolution because the atmosphere is so dense, right? Is that the word I'm looking for? Dense? Compared to Earth's? Oh, they moved Perseverance off the front page. Well, that was disappointing. Rare is opposite of, oh, okay. All I know is they spin super, super, super fast. Because we've seen it. Um, we had a demonstration of it. It's like, like, oh my God. It's crazy. Let me just. There's no, there's been no blog updates for 21 days. Really? Where are these from? What day is this? February 22nd. These aren't new. Okay. Those aren't new. I'm looking for anything that's new. Um, what day is this? February 19th. Nothing new. Um, what about, what did you say? Curiosity. Three thousand day. Has there been July six, twenty twenty? Lord, they really need to do. November 12th, 2020. August 3rd, 2020. Man, they're just not updating. Shush. It's not updating like it should. 
Anything new on the James Webb? Nope. Nope. Sooner or later, that'll launch. Hopefully this year. Like, image of the day, image galleries, image of the day. Oh, that's right. They did do the, um, let's see what, March 11th. Is that today? The expedition 64 crew had a busy science day observing worms, redditing small satellites for deployment and conducting vision tests. Two astronauts are also pressing ahead with preparation for the third spacewalk in two weeks at the International Space Station. Tiny worms were launched to the orbiting lab in February. To study how weightlessness affects genetic expression in muscles, today NASA flight engineer Shanna Walker loaded cassette samples containing the live worms into microscopes for viewing. Next, NASA flight engineer Kate Rubens will record microscopic video of the worm's activity to understand the effects on spaceflight on the muscles. Observation may lead ways to maintain and improve muscle health for humans on and off Earth. Soon, a set of small satellites will deploy outside the, of the Japanese Kibo Laboratory Module, JAXA, Japanese Aerospace Exploitation Agency. Astronaut Sochi Noguchi loaded the tiny satellites, also called CubeSats, in a deployer that will be placed inside Kibo's airlock. The airlock will be closed and depressurized before the Japanese robotic arm grabs the deployer and stages it in a position where the CubeSats will be ejected into orbit a few days later. It has been a bit, it has been a busy period for spacewalks at the station as two astronauts gear up for another excursion to maintain cooling system and communication gear. Victor Glover and Michael Hopkins of NASA radiate their spacewalk tubes and safety tethers in the U.S. Quest airlock where their spacesuits are already, already located. Afterwards, they were joined by Rubens, who will assist in spacewalks this weekend for procedure reviews. NASA TV will go on air Saturday, 6 a.m. to broadcast the spacewalk set to begin at 7.30. Oh, that's a, at least a little bit more reasonable time than 4 o'clock in the morning. Vision is critical to mission success, and researchers are continuously studying how microgravity affects human eyes. Cosmonauts Sergi and Sergei partnered together Thursday afternoon, reading an eye chart as they part, part of regular scheduled eye checks. Some crew members have documented eye pressure and vision issues after living in space for months at a time. Missing mission controller in Houston command the Canadian Arm 2 robotic arm to release an external pallet loaded with old nickel hydrogen batteries into Earth's orbit on Thursday morning. It is safely moving away from the station and will orbit Earth between two and four years before burning up harmlessly in the atmosphere. Are you serious? What? Why not put them back on a something and bring it back to earth. Oh, Roscosmos, Sergey is, oh, no. Sergey and Sergey have completed the work to repair small cracks in the transfer compartment of the Russian, Zev yeah, however you say, service module. The repairs were part of an ongoing work to isolate and fix the source of the slight cabin air leak, which is an increase above the standard rate that the station teams have been investigating over the past year. Oh, you mean this place where something was screwed? Like a screw hole? At the current rate, the crew is in no danger, and the space station has ample full consumable aboard to manage and maintain the nominal environment. In the coming days, 
I don't know who that is. I don't even know how to say his name. I guess they're two Russians. We'll close the hatches to the transfer compartment to ensure Russian flight controllers to conduct pressure levels check to analyze the results of the sealing procedures. Who? Sergey. Okay. Hello, Canton. Juice, you're not from Canton. Oh, Ohio. That's right. I'm thinking Canton, Georgia. You're here. There you go, Juicy. Your first time on HAPS. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. You made it. Whoop, whoop. You made it. You made it. So. Oh, wow. I've been on an hour and a half. I want to stay on a good schedule. I do want to stay on a good schedule, y'all. It's 1130. Yeah, it was going to be sooner or later. But Juice, I mean, uh, I, I don't know what you enjoy watching. Um, but most of the people, not the drama scopers, but most of us are here. Um, I don't know who you used to watch and stuff. Um, but you can do a search um, on the feed and then go up to the little... Um, and by the way, they do. If you have a computer, the broadcast studio is amazing because you can multicast. I'm going to four platforms right now, you know, Periscope, Twitter, YouTube, and my Space Gal page. So, and if anyone is commenting on Facebook, I'm not seeing your comments. I'm sorry, but come over to the Hops World. Top of my page, there's an invite link. So, okay, so Piano Man, Debbie, Piano Man's going to be on at 1030 in the morning for our crossword. So. But I'm going to get off here, everyone. I got to go do, uh, take the clothes. You know, I thought I washed my clothes today. Came home, folded some stuff up. Uh, so, Juicy, um, when you go into, you, first of all, you when you set up, you got to go into your settings and you'll connect all your, yeah, 7.30 your time. It, yeah. Um, you'll go into your uh, HAP settings and hang on. Let me make sure it's under settings. Go to your profile. Is it? Yeah. Go to your profile. And then go to settings. I think it's in settings, profile, settings, social, and you'll, you'll see a drop down box and you'll go to that drop down box and you'll go to social and socials and multicasting. And then you'll connect your different uh, platforms there. And you can turn them on or you can leave them off. But then when, if you do go live, what will happen is when you go live, you'll have these bars going across and you can turn ones on and off. If you join into people's broadcast, please make sure you shut them all off and just leave only haps on. And the reason we ask for this um, is because of trolls. So thank you, Debbie. 
and every day you log in juicy you get 50 coins um, make sure you have your emails on for your only your weekly that's all you need a email for is your weekly you open that up you get so many coins um, if you go to your profile page if you go to your profile page and scroll up you'll see this one here underneath uh, your share link coins and rewards um, and when you scroll down there's different activities to do there's different activities here to do. Um, and it just gives you ways to earn coins, right? There's ways to earn coins, Juicy. And then you can give those in awards to other broadcasters, right? And you can start earning right away, Juice. Hey, Troy, how are you? No, you get, oh my God, Troy, those cookies look so huge. Like one is going to be an entire meal. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Hearts back at you. Yeah, you can get real money too, Juice. You start earning right away. So those, that, those uh, coins right there that Troy and Debbie have given me, they get into my bank. I've already cashed out. Um, when I went up to Daytona, I cashed out already. So I'm good. I'm good, Troy. Good day today. Yep. So you need $200 to cash out. But, you know, it is what it is. It may take you some time or whatever. But, you know... You know, um, you can get a VIP badge here and be good, Juicy. I'm telling you now, this is not Periscope. This is not Periscope and they don't play here. So you got to be very good here. And you got to watch your music too. Just a fair warning. TOSs haven't changed, but... Mm-hmm. It is better than per Periscope, but just remember to behave here. So that's the only thing I do suggest, Juice, you know? I, I You know me, I'm straight up, right? So I, I, be nice to broadcasters and everything and, and stuff. And Troy, for Sports for the Blind, give him a follow. Uh, he teaches you about all the sports that blind people play. play. You would be amazed at, at all the sports that they play. Yeah, so see, and also, Juicy, if you look up top of my broadcast, it says 50% of $50 gold. So at the beginning of March, it's every first of the month, it goes back to zero. And then you can keep earning. I like the private chat with people in your broadcast. Does it actually work, Troy? I thought everyone can see that. I thought that wasn't fixed. It only works with people that are, are in, like, when you're up with me. Is that when it works? Is that what you mean? Oh, it does work. Okay. Yes. And Juicy, this will give you that chance. You know, um, if you have any followers over there that you like, make sure you um, let them know to follow you over, that you're over here and stuff. That's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. That That's the big thing. It's getting all your people to come over. Because I think once Periscope shuts down, our numbers are drastically gonna. I'm gonna lose nine, not over nine thousand people with as many purchases they had. 
kind of sucks. Really sucks with all the purges. Really, Jerry? You're done with the internet for, di for today? I don't think you are. The things people post that I follow. Uh-oh. We heard you like rocket photos. Here's another look at NASA's. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. Hang on. I already followed you. I already followed you, Juicy. Make sure you follow me. So, and, and I'll teach you a little quick lesson, right? So, yeah, and that's your invite link there. Um. I've already followed you. You'll have the HAPS. Uh, they will do like today. Um, the HAPS team streams different hours, but tomorrow the HAPS team will do um, where they feature everyone's videos. So um, every I've, I've been featured twice, um, two weeks ago, right? Well, this will be, what, three weeks ago. And then a couple of weeks before that. But... Um, that's a good way to fi find new people to follow. Um, the discovery tab, I'm not too thrilled about the discovery tab, but um, they're working on it. They're working on the discovery tab. So um, they are working on the discovery tab. But it gives you a little bit of an idea. You know Alexis, the cook? The one they used to cook in the morning. She's around. Vanita is here. Um, I don't know. All the scopers are here. Banner man. I don't know who you used to follow and stuff, but they're around. You just search. You'll find people. Go into people's broadcast. Um, the more you comment um, in different broadcasts, it's you'll get top commenter, different things you can earn. Can't pro, you can't post anything yet on your page, links or nothing like that. You have to be on Haps for a little while before they allow that. Yeah, and we have a new update coming uh, next week. Stabilization they're working on, performance issues. Um, so it's a new platform. They're expanding quickly. Hopefully their servers are going to expand some more, but because um, I see a latency issue already today. But yeah, I'm going to be good and I'm going to bed so I get up at a decent time in the morning. I'm trying to keep myself on track because I have an early doctor's appointment next week, so early. Yeah, darn it. You just, Troy, go trolling around for a little while. You know, go trolling around for a little while. Make a few comments on, go and check out some older broadcasts, right? And you'll have it back. It updates every couple of hours or something like that. It's really hard to keep up with. You just drop in, hit that one I'm from, I'm from. So people kind of know. I like when people do that, uh, Troy. And then I know they watched my video, right? You know, they just, you know, drop a little note, a like, I see it. What if PewDiePie comes alive? I mean, what if, what if he does? He can. Why would he leave? He probably won't because um, he's got a contract with YouTube. So I, I don't know about PewDiePie. That's a different, that's a different beast there. So. And he can't multicast. And I don't think he can be on another platform. So, live streaming. But, all right, everyone. Everyone have a great night. Peace out. I'll see everyone in the morning. Good night.